SEP Fanfic Readings presents Finding Hermione by Ebook Dragon. This chapter is edited to maintain YouTube's content guidelines. Chapter 18 The Ball, December 14th. This was the first ball in a long time Draco was actually excited about attending. Hermione left early that morning for a spa day with his mother, Jenny, Daphne, Tracy, and Helena. The plan was to get massages, manicures, pedicures, and generally relaxed into a state of bliss. After that, makeup and hairstylists would get them ready before sending them back home to dress. Draco had been forbidden to see Hermione until just before they left for the ball. Draco was glad the girls had asked his mother to come along and got to be part of the fun, and he thought most of those weren't real friends anyway. The absence of Hermione left Draco and Rose to get into their own mischief to while away the hours. He took her to the park to fly around, first with him on his broom, and then on her own. She practiced catching a snitch. Draco also started teaching her to play the other Quidditch positions. Since she could catch a snitch, catching a quaffle would be easy enough. He tossed a Nerf ball to her while she balanced on her broom, then as she flew around. They played in the park until it was time for lunch. Tansy had gone to the manor to help them with the preparations for the ball, so Draco was left to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for him and Rose. An overabundance of strawberry jelly led to a mess of a monumental proportion all over the kitchen countertops. He laughed a lot as Rose tried licking the jelly off the countertops. It was hard getting her to stop since she wasn't taking him seriously. He put Rose down for her nap after cleaning her up and the kitchen. He had a feeling Tansy would throw something at him if he left a mess in her kitchen. Left to his own devices until Rose woke up and it was time to take her to Molly's, Draco made his own preparations for the night. Hermione had said that tonight was special, which meant that she expected it to end in only one way. Bouquets of red and orange roses were levitated into her room and placed on either side of her dressing table. Draco respected her private space and only stayed in the doorway. He desperately wanted to find the dress in the closet. He tried to read. He kept staring down at the same page but never taking in a word that was written. The excitement and the nerves were really starting to get to him. No matter how many times he tried telling himself it was just a ball, it just wouldn't work. It wasn't just a ball. It wasn't even about the blasted ball. It was about the next stage of their relationship. It was about finally being with her. He was excited and nervous. More nervous than his first time with Pansy. More excited than on his wedding night. It wasn't fair to either lady, and he knew that. Astoria would have understood. This was Hermione. This was his soulmate the woman he'd waited for his whole life. After everything that had happened to her, she deserved a spectacular night, and he was determined not to disappoint. Finally, after hours of waiting and preparing, it was almost time. Almost time to see Hermione. Almost time to leave for the ball, to dance the night away, to return home for other delights. He adjusted the emerald cufflinks one last time and picked up the jewelry box that held the necklace and earrings that his mother picked out to go with her dress. He waited for Hermione at the foot of the stairs, clutching the black velvet box in his hands. He turned in his pacing, and there she was, standing at the top of the stairs. The box slid out of his hands and hit the floor with a thunk and a jingle of protesting jewels. She was exquisite. Her hair was piled high on her head with her curls artfully arranged around two emerald hair combs, exposing the line of her neck with tendrils of curls framing her face and accentuating her elegant beauty. The dress looked like it had been made with her in mind. The dress was a floor-length emerald green satin that just begged to be touched. The strapless, sweetheart neckline dipped low and accentuated the fullness of her breasts. The mermaid-style dress was tight against her hips before it flared out to the floor. Every beautiful curve was shown off to perfection. He wanted to fall to his knees and worship her for the goddess she was. An amused laugh brought him back to the realization that he'd been staring, and probably with his mouth hanging open. You. You look stunning, he stammered. She tucked a red rose into his buttonhole and said, You look pretty stunning yourself. Her black-gloved hands smoothed down the front of his tuxedo. He couldn't stop staring at her. The black of her gloves made the cuff at her wrist stand out and sparkle in the light. It was there, on display, for all the world to see— their claim on each other. "'You dropped something,' she said. He looked down and remembered the fallen jewelry. He picked up the box and opened it for her to see. 
her gasp of surprise causing a grin to break out on his face. He took out the necklace and walked behind her to drape it around her neck and fasten it. The large, teardrop emerald lay just above her cleavage, with pear-shaped diamonds in decreasing size circling her neck. He handed her the simple, matching emerald studs to slide into her ears. He ran his fingertips slightly across the creamy flesh of her exposed shoulders. She shivered against him. He pulled her back against him, kissing her behind her ear. She ground that sweet ass of hers against his painfully hard erection. He bit lightly on her earlobe and growled low in her ear. Don't tease me, witch. It's taking all of my self-control I have to not throw your skirts up and fuck you against that wall. She turned and looked up at him with heavy-lidded eyes. He could smell her desire intertwined with her floral perfume. A soft hand slid up the tent in his trousers, causing him to throw back his head and groan, thrusting into her hand. All too soon, the teasing hand was gone. "'We need to go. I promised your mom we wouldn't be late,' she said, stepping back from him with a teasing grin. He grabbed her hand and put it back where it was. "'You're such a cruel temptress,' he whined. "'The sooner we leave, the sooner we'll be back,' she said, laughing, squeezing him a little and pulling her hand away. That galvanized him into action. He pulled on her arm and drug her to the drawing room to the fireplace with indecent haste, wanting now more than ever to get this ball over with. He'd waited long enough to be with her. He could hear her mumbling behind him about sticking charms and corsets not being comfortable to run in. He threw a pinch of flu powder into the fireplace and said, Malfoy Mena, receiving room. With an arm around Hermione, they were both gone to the ball. They arrived in the receiving room of Malfoy Manor to find his mother waiting to greet the guests. His mother looked regal in her midnight blue gown with a silver lace overlay. After brushing the ash from Hermione and himself, he walked forward and kissed his mother on the cheek. "'You look beautiful as always, mother,' he said. "'Thank you, darling. You look quite handsome as well,' she said before turning to Hermione. "'You, my dear, look stunning. I knew that dress was perfect for you as soon as I saw it. Don't you think so, Draco? Absolutely exquisite, mother, Draco answered. Thank you both, Hermione said. You look amazing, Narcissa. What can we do to help? Well, since you offered, you can both help Greek guests as they arrive. The house elves will take their donations and put them away. Draco groaned inwardly at being stuck in the receiving line. He sent Turvey to find him a glass of scotch to make the endless schmoozing more bearable. The three of them greeted each guest that came through the fireplace for the next forty-five minutes. He watched Hermione as she charmed the guests. She greeted most of them by name, and always had some personal question to ask those she knew, often startling those outside of their circle that she would not only remember their names, but also would remember some small detail from a previous conversation, or ask after their children or grandchildren. She could have been born to the life of a society wife, groomed from birth, much like his mother, with the effortless way she seemed to charm the people around her. He was glad she wasn't, though. Being a society wife would have bored Hermione to tears. Eventually, they were released to go mingle before the dancing started. They made their way to the ballroom where everyone was gathered. Their friends were all gathered around, talking and sipping champagne. It was surreal seeing the group gathered together, and comfortable. Slytherins and Gryffindors getting along with one another— rising above house rivalries like they'd never been able to do as teenagers. "'There you two are. We were beginning to think you had snuck away to snog in a dark corner,' Blaze said, earning him an elbow from his wife. "'No such luck,' said Draco. He tried, too. He also tried convincing Hermione that they could flew back home without anyone noticing. "'Hermione, that's quite a bracelet you have on there,' Harry said. The group turned, seemingly as one, all interested in the cuff on Hermione's arm that very clearly had the Malfoy crest on it. Draco looked down at Hermione just as she looked up at him, biting on her lip. Clearly she was worried about how much to reveal to their friends in such a public setting. "'Well, you see, Draco and I,' Hermione said. "'Draco, Hermione, there you are. The band is ready to start, and I'd like you two to open the ball up,' his mother said. "'Thank goodness for interruptions.' "'Duty calls.' Draco said to their friends, taking Hermione's hand in his and leading her to the center of the dance floor. Draco spun Hermione into position, flaring out her dress all around her in a swish of satin, and bowed formally over her hand. Hermione sunk into a deep curtsy, smiling mischievously up at him and affording him an enticing view of her cleavage. She rose and placed her left hand on his shoulder, very clearly displaying her cuff with the Malfoy crest on it. Draco recognized the familiar start of Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty waltz. 
Draco led Hermione through turns and lifts of the waltz. Draco noted out of his periphery that other couples had joined them on the dance floor. He only had eyes for the witch in his arms, though. She was mouthing words in time to the beat of the music. Curious, he asked, What are you singing? It's a song from the Disney version of this piece. I must have watched the cartoon a thousand times growing up. How does it go? he asked. I know you. I walked with you once upon a dream. I know you. The gleam in your eyes is so familiar a gleam. Yet I know it's true that visions are seldom all they seem. But if I know you, I know what you'll do. You'll love me at once, the way you did once, upon a dream. She sang as they danced. Beautiful and very true, Draco said as the waltz ended. Draco smiled at the blush on Hermione's cheeks at his words, as he bowed low over her hand again, kissing her knuckles. "'Do you want to keep dancing, or should we go sate our friend's curiosity?' he asked. "'We won't be able to hold them at bay much longer,' Hermione said. "'I don't think tonight is the best time for that conversation, though.' Draco nodded his agreement. He led them back to where their friends had congregated once again, snatching two flutes of champagne from a passing house-elf. "'You two dance beautifully together!' "'Tracy said as they joined the group. "'Jenny pierced Hermione with a look as she murmured their thanks. "'What's with the bracelet, Hermione?' "'Gotta love Gryffindor directness,' Draco thought. "'It's a family piece,' Hermione said, "'not exactly lying, but not revealing the whole truth. "'Very Slytherin of her.' "'Is there something you need to tell us, Draco?' Theo asked. "'Not at this exact moment, no,' Draco said, "'knowing that Theo was expecting some sort of engagement announcement "'as a means to explain the cuff.' The soul seeks one who mirrors its own, Luna intoned dreamily beside them. Um, quite right, Luna, Hermione said. You are looking lovely tonight. Draco privately thought he might need sunglasses if he had to keep looking at the strange witch. Luna was wearing a breezy, sunshine yellow dress that fell in gauzy layers to the floor. Combined with her blonde hair and pale complexion, the effect was a bit of an eyesore. Thank you, Hermione. I love yellow. It keeps the rack splits away, and it is their mating season, you know. Slytherin looks good on you. Draco inhaled the sip of his champagne and choked, earning him a sharp look from Hermione. The rest of the group chuckled, not really reading anything into Luna's odd ramblings. The house elf came around again, and Draco passed around fresh glasses. Just sparkling water for me, thanks, Ginny said. The elf handed her a flute of water. Ginny? Hermione asked. Draco noted that while everyone was distracted by the interplay with Hermione, Ginny, and Harry, the elf discreetly replaced Daphne's champagne with water as well. "'It's really all your fault, Hermione. All those girls' nights,' Ginny said. Hermione screamed in delight, jumping up and down, throwing her arms around her two friends. "'Oh, my God! Congratulations! Oh, I hope it's a girl this time!' Draco lifted his glass and eyed Theo and Daphne as well. "'A toast to new life.' The group raised their glasses and toasted the potter's good fortune. Theo and Daphne could keep their secret for now. He knew they had been trying for years without success, and would want to keep it a secret for a little while, until they were sure this time would stick. He'd thought they'd given up and sent up a prayer that they'd get their wish this time. His mother found them again. She went around the group greeting them all again, kissing Ginny on both cheeks in congratulations, touching Daphne's hand lightly, tipping Hannah's chin up with a quiet, "'Your time will come soon.' a hug for Tracy and Helena, and whispered words to Luna. "'Mother, may I have this dance?' Draco asked. "'Surely you want to dance with Hermione?' his mother protested. "'Oh, no. I'm going to sit this one out and go in search of a powder room,' Hermione said. "'See, mother, now you really must dance with me,' Draco said, leading his mother out onto the dance floor. Draco stood with his mother on one side, and Hermione on the other, on the raised dais that the band was situated on. Thank you all for coming tonight and supporting our annual charity ball. This ball started out for my mother and myself as a way to make reparations for our part in the war, and we are happy that it has become an annual event that draws such good people who want to help those less fortunate. The proceeds from this year's ball will fund scholarships for underprivileged children going to Hogwarts. As our last song for the night, I have requested something from my own years at Hogwarts. During our fourth year, my friends and I we were lucky enough to attend the Yule Ball as part of the Triwizard Tournament. 
That particular ball brought about a stunning revelation for me that has brought a new happiness to my life, along with many new friendships. Please grab a partner and join Hermione and me on the dance floor for the last dance of the night. Draco took Hermione's hand and led her again onto the center of the dance floor. Their friends all joined them in the inner circle of the dance floor. Harry grumbled good-naturedly about once being more than enough for that dance. "'I've been waiting to dance this with you for nineteen years,' Draco said, remembering her in a different gown, just as beautiful, but in a different, more innocent way. "'Better late than never,' Hermione said to him. "'I can't wait to get you alone, though.' Draco grinned at her as he lifted and spun her. "'Have I told you that you look like a Christmas present?' "'Are you ready to unwrap your present, then?' Hermione asked him pishly. Draco waggled his eyebrows at her. "'So ready.' He had purposely maneuvered them to the doors of the ballroom as they slipped out just as the song ended and raced away to the flue. Draco led Hermione into his room. A flick of his wand and the candles he'd arranged earlier flamed to life, bathing the room in a soft glow. The blues and recently added purples mixed with the firelight, making the room look like a sunset over open waters. He drew her into his arms and gazed into her eyes. "'Have I told you how beautiful you are tonight?' he asked. A smile quirked on her lips. "'You might have mentioned it,' she said, her hands sliding up his forearms to wrap around his neck. "'It bears repeating. You are so beautiful. Having you here with me is a fantasy come to life.' He kissed her then. The soft, tender caress became hungry and demanding as their desire for each other mounted. Her hands drifted down to the buttons of his tuxedo jacket as she kissed him. Once she loosened the buttons, her hands slid back up and pushed the jacket off his shoulders. He let his arms fall to his side so the jacket would fall to the floor. He started backing them up to the settee at the foot of his bed as she loosened the knot of his bow tie. He turned and guided her to sit down, dropping to his knees in front of her. He grasped her ankles and slid the silver-heeled sandal off her foot, massaging the arch of her foot. He grasped the other ankle and repeated the same treatment to her other foot, relishing in her hums of appreciation. He'd found the jeweled combs in her hair and pulled them out. Her hair, once released from its hold, fell in a riot of curls over her shoulder. Draco ran his hands along her scalp, massaging life back into her tender scalp. His attention was rewarded with her shivers of delight— he knew it was uncomfortable for her to have all that hair up for so long, and left with headaches and a sore head. She worked the buttons on his shirt, untucking his shirt and taking the cufflinks out of his cuffs. He heard the clink as they were set on the table beside her hair combs. Hermione stood up and turned, presenting her back to him. He found the tie of the corset backing at her hips, and worked loose the knot and loosened the tie so that it could be drawn down. A sigh of relief escaped Hermione as the corset loosened and allowed her to breathe more freely. Draco circled her running his fingertips lightly down her neck and shoulder, then across the tops of her cleavage. He delighted in the goosebumps that trailed along after his fingers and the hitch in her breathing. The bodice of her dress gaped now that he loosened it, giving him an enticing view of what treasures lay underneath. "'Is this what you want, my lioness?' he asked huskily. He stared into those chocolate eyes, searching for any hint of hesitation on her part. He could see the heat in her eyes as she looked back at him. She licked her lips, and he had to resist the desire to capture the pink tongue that darted out. She pushed his gaping dress shirt off his shoulders to fall to the floor by her shoes. The undershirt soon followed and was draped to the floor. Her hands ran across his bare waist right above his waistband of his pants, reminding him that she still had her gloves on. The silky touch sent thrills of pleasure shooting down to his groin. The touch traveled up over his abs and pecs, drifting across the scar across his chest from the battle with her best friend, to settle around his neck again. She drew his head down to her lips. "'Make love to me, Draco,' she whispered against his mouth, and rose up on her toes to kiss him. He collapsed in exhaustion on top of her, panting hard and burying his face into the crook of her neck. The rapid rise and fall of her chest matched his own. She moved her captured wrist, and he let go of the cuff. Her hands ran along his arms and back, causing goose flesh to rise in the wake of her touch. That was... Uh, amazing, she said quietly with wonder. Earth-shattering, he mumbled into her hair. He regained enough strength to stop squishing her with his weight and rolled off of her 
pulling her with him so that she was draped on top of him, and ran his hand down her hair and back. He tipped her face up to his and kissed her, slow and sweet, pouring all the unsaid words into the feeling of her lips against his. He felt the wetness of her tears against the palm of his hand. He pulled back and brushed away the tears with his thumbs. "'Why are you crying, love?' "'I'm just so happy,' she said, laying her head on his chest. He accioed his wand to him from the nightstand and extinguished the candles in the room. He pulled the blankets back up to cover them both. She scooted into him, slinging a leg over his, and her hand coming to rest on his chest over his heart. He tightened his arm around her and covered her with his own. He could feel her body relaxing into sleep, did off with her. He sighed, feeling more complete and at peace than he had ever felt.' 